I'm Dave Bryant, and our guest tonight, Mr. Al McDowell. Have you ever had a situation where you had a mentor who was slightly younger than you were? This may indeed be the situation here for me because um, I think I met Al in 1983, something like, mm, that, something like that, when I used to uh, go down and see the, uh, the old primetime rehearse in uh, New York. And then um, we were in the uh, 90s primetime together for the better part of 10 years or so. And interestingly enough, this is the first time we've spoken, so I'm really looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, good. absolutely. <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Here we are. Mm -hmm. is, wow, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, those were the days when Arnett was around. Those rehearsals with the first band there. Mm. That really. was that was that was amazing. And there's another video somewhere I think on Tom Hall's 365 Improv Live 365 series where I talked about that experience and being able to hear you guys rehearse. And at first, everything sounded alike to me. Mm -hmm. But you guys would be like, oh, that was a good version there. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, it sounded just like the last one. What's the difference? But gradually, as I picked up what was going on, I could tell what the thing was. And I'd be like, oh, yes. that's, a, that's a one. <clears throat> but I could get up in between. Take, when you guys would break, I could mm -hmm. get up, talk to any of you, ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you guys didn't welcome me in as a fellow virtuoso. <laughs> you took me in as, as a stray dog. <laughs> I followed yeah. you home. Can we keep him on that? You know, it was like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, no. The, it, the way you were playing it joined in perfectly, man. No, it was just yeah. the, you guys were just so generous with your time and your knowledge and um, just always just so appreciative that I just wanted to learn from you. Mm. And so always, if I get struck by lightning before the interview's over, <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you for that. Totally so I pleasure. really appreciate that. So tell me, you know, we don't like to start these things with, you know, when did your parents realize you were talented? But right. More like, <laughs> right. more like, when did you meet Ornette? Mm. Like, how did that happen? It was my second year in high school, music and art. Um, he came into uh, the school to look for a bass player, and he went to Justin DiCiocio, the um, music chairman, and he directed him to me. He came and pulled me out of my English class and. Um, you know, told me to come down and rehearse. And I said, well, okay, audition for the band, okay. So I didn't know who he was at first, and I went to Kenny Washington. And Kenny Washington told me, Ornette Coleman, hey man, you gotta go, you gotta just, you just gotta go. So I went, and went, when I went down there, you know, you think you're gonna be playing Blue Bossa or some type of jazz song <laughs> that, you know, that people know or whatever. But no, they were playing just like they were playing it was it's hard to describe you know it was them playing but they were being themselves so everything was coming out at the same time so I figured they were just right. playing then when we got the first show it was like what's what are we gonna play on it well first we'll do number one then we'll do number two <laughs> <laughs> it was, I said oh wow this is something so your high school though that you went to was Music and art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The art. famous uh, school yeah. there in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did not go to a music and art high school. I yeah. went to the uh, Why Aren't You an Athlete High School. <laughs> <laughs> did they have a music um, part of your school? You know, it was mostly like marching band and chorus and that kind of thing. So any kind of when piano thing. When did you thing. start playing? Uh, <laughs> nobody. Uh, play there. This is this, uh, this, uh, this uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I'll get interviewed later, <laughs> but but yeah, you know, sometime I, I, I mm -hmm. and uh, you know when I was first, I wanted to be a, a guitar player like the Beatles, you know. Mm. So, I, but can you play guitar? So, uh, you know, mm. so you know, I, I try not to talk about it too much. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, mm. yeah. So anyway, so here's what I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. because this is the question I should have asked you 35 years ago, mm -hmm. all right? So say I'm a, a musician of, of any instrument, okay? A player of any instrument, but I've just gotten the call to play with Ornette. So the que three questions are, what is the most important thing for me to keep in mind? What skills are most important 
for me to have to utilize on the gig? And finally, third, what must I never, ever do under any circumstances? Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, Unfortunately, I didn't ask you that 35 years ago. Yeah, well, the first one, um, you know, it's good to be comfortable with your instrument in the way that you feel comfortable with yourself. You know, you don't want to be lacking in something that you want to do or an ability that you want to have when you're trying to play your instrument. You want to be comfortable. Yeah. And then the second thing is um, you want to um, give each note equal attention. You know, you want to play like it's your last time ever playing and you want to mean everything that you play so much as even to sing it from your soul. It's hard to describe that, you know, and it's hard to get to that level because you have to be comfortable and you have, then you have to be playing the music that allows you to be that creative, yeah, yeah. you know. And you know, one thing you should never do probably is um, not be a person of your word. If you say you're going to be there for rehearsal, be there for rehearsal. Yeah, if you're going to yeah. be on time, be on time and don't really argue with the leader too much. <laughs> It's their show. Let yeah. them do what they're gonna do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Mm. All good advice. You're right. <laughs> right. That's good. Now, your particular gifts of um, your phenomenal memory for detail, mm. and just you could when we were playing in the '90s, if Warnett wanted to call some obscure tune he played once in 1983, you knew all the parts. And mm. also just your, your skills perception. I know you're working some now as doing sound and yeah. live sound mm -hmm. and things like that, but I know I've heard you mix recordings and do the different kind of engineering work like that. Mm -hmm. And just for that music where it's often said that uh, everybody's soloing at the same time and there's, you know, there's no foreground and background, but mm. not everybody can hear it that way to, it, exactly. to mix it that way for it to be perceived that way. And um, you just seem to have such a clear perception mm -hmm. of that and, uh, and such a, an ear for detail like that, that uh, just those combinations of things. And also, I noticed when we were uh, rehearsing at Soundcheck today, so easy when we were soloing together, because I've you know, played in situations right. sometimes where it's like you've got a couple of different lines going, but your ideas were so clear and cogent it was very easy to stay out of your way. You yeah, know what I mean? It was, it, because yeah. it was declared, it wasn't like, has he finished that phrase yet? Right. Can, should I jump in? It's like, no, I can hear exactly what it was. Right, right. So, you know, yeah. so I hope I didn't take my half up the middle, but oh, no, 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 it was no. like. You, you know, you have the experience, you know, so, you know, you're naturally equipped to play the right stuff in this music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Naturally. Well, I should yeah. learn to do something else sometime. Mm. Well, <laughs> hopefully we can play a lot more, man, and have you play with us, man. That would be great. No, no, this, is, this mm. was fabulous. This was fabulous. Mm. So, um, you know, one thing we were talking about was uh, was how much we miss our friend Burn Nix. Yeah, Burn. And just how much he did, added to this music. And I always thought, so when you came in, who was in the band when you walked in the first mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. Charlie Ellaby, Vern Nix, Jamal Adin, and um, Donato. And so Calvin wasn't playing? Yeah, he no. wasn't there yet. Okay. And Calvin came in, and um, um, Kamal Sabir came in. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so this would have been, but I know there's that of Human Feelings record that we were talking about. You where know, actually, yeah. <clears throat> when I first got there, Ed Blackwell was playing with us. Oh, very yeah, cool. He was, he was playing alongside Donato. Wow. Prime time. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, that's some, some trivia. We've got a yeah. headline here. You're right. <laughs> I, yeah, we got a scoop. So um, how long did that last, do you know? Maybe about a year, like one wow. tour, something like that, one and a half tours. Because I know there's that earlier band with um, Higgins, you know, and Blood and Sarone, you know, mm -hmm. that quartet. So that's interesting that he still had Higgins and Blackwell at different yeah. times in the early right. prime time. Right. So this would have been, uh, so I wonder had, uh, you know, on that Human Feelings record that was uh, Byrne and Charlie and Jamal uh, and Calvin, I wonder if uh, Calvin had left them to go with Blood and this was like in that period, so it, it, had Calvin already been in the band once? Hmm. You know? In the prime time? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think he had, yeah. Okay. I think so, yeah. Because I'm trying to get... I think because that's how blood, um, Calvin met blood, right? Yeah, okay. Because yeah. right. I'm trying to get, you know, my timeline straight. Mm. Cause I know it's he was, hard, it's so, such a blur. Yeah, because yeah. he was in, and then he was out, and then he was in again, and then he mm -hmm. was out again, you know? Yeah, the problem was, you know, we were both playing with other people. You know, at that time I was playing with Luther and Howard Johnson. Right, Luther Vandross. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah, Grace Jones. And I had my own band. I had put an, out an album called Zalmac. Uh -huh. Yeah, Zelaine Macuso. Right, right. And I know you uh, uh, had the uh, Grandma Vision uh, Messiah album mm -hmm. too, right? right. Yeah. And that was after you'd been with Ornette. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So who was playing on that? On the Grandma Vision album? Yeah, yeah. Um, Jeff Champa, um, Terry Silverlight, um, Jack O'Neill. And myself, I played keyboards, bass, piccolo. You'd done another solo project, but mm -hmm. then after you'd had some primetime experience, you did another solo project. Mm -hmm. So how did the primetime experience inform that later solo project compared to the first one? I tried to stay away from Ornette's type of creation. You know, with my own thing, I tried to be more commercial with mine, but still have that edge. At that time, fusion was around, right. you know, so, and it was on its way out. They had stopped with all the um, radio stations that played that type of music, and it was very hard to get played or anything during that time. So, you know, I always went, you know, that's what the critics asked me. How come I didn't do harm melodics with my record? It's his music, it's, it's like, only he knows it 100%, and, I just can't help but to bring this in there. Right. Every single time when I, for, for the first 10, 15 years playing with him, every time he said, you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> One of three go, and he just blew us away to the point where, I mean, how could you keep up with him when he was so proficient yeah. with his instrument? And that's what I mean about being comfortable. He was comfortable not only with his instrument, but with his theory and his concept of what yeah. he wanted to sound like, and all those things together is like an arrow right towards the bullseye. You know, he, know, he knew his whole tone for the way he played. Right. Nobody sounded like him. You know, I, it took me a long time to figure out how to place phrases, and this yeah. is another thing that you do so well, and that especially Byrne did so well, but anybody who is able to take these little clean, pithy phrases, and in that scenario where there's so much going on, right? and just be able to, not just spatially, but even harmonically, to be mm -hmm. able to hear, all right, what's, where's the place that uh, it won't be so dissonant that it's buried? Right, it's and a matter yet, of timing. And yet, right. yeah, but it's also it, that what Ornette used to talk about, ringing two or three keys at once, mm -hmm. where somebody's in a different key and it actually inadvertently helps boost you rather than right. blocks you. Right. But it's like you have to learn how to, to hear that and where that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know that thing when he told us that time about um, uh, two triads, no. major, minor, augmented, diminished, have yeah. either got a common tone between them or yeah. only separated by a half, half step. step. Yeah. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, "Yeah, that's unbelievable." So I don't have to set it up with two fives to get from here to yeah, there. Yeah, right. It's, it's like you can do a common, all, right? Already there or a half step yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's you, incredible. You can just to have a common about. tone pivot or a chromatic right. yeah, thing. It's unbelievable. It's to right think next about door, and it was like that was so useful because there was some stuff that, right. like, till the end, the clefts, and I was yeah, scratching right. my head, "What am I going right. to do with that?" And no time signature. Right. The phrasing thing too and lots of people ask me about this because he can he would just spontaneously not just generate chord progressions mm -hmm. but you know how they talk about in solfege having a movable dough when you mm -hmm. change keys mm -hmm. he would have a movable one yeah, you know what i mean absolutely yeah absolutely and it's yeah. funny because it took me a while too to to figure out the first time i heard you lay into a funk groove with Donardo, mm -hmm. i thought what's he hanging on to? Because I couldn't figure out, you know, where the thing was, because it wasn't like a, you know, a pocket thing. Right, right. And yet it was there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how, how is this working? Because I was, I think I was trying to do like a, a clavinet thing or something like mm -hmm. that, you know. 
and I just couldn't figure out where to put it. And then I realized as long as I was just definitive about where one was, mm -hmm. the rest would take care of itself. Yeah. And it would just be there, but it was sort of like to have the courage to at least, well, okay, well, here's where it is. But then as soon as I did, just the universe rearranged itself. Absolutely. And there, there was a pocket, you know, and I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's really amazing. And mine could be different from yours. Yeah. And they both work. That's and right. Donardo, who seemed to be playing with neither of us, was accommodating both of them. Yeah, because all somebody needed was that sound to be there to have them go with, in right. any tempo, even if it was obscure, right. you know? So Ornette's thing was, one was wherever he started the next phrase, you know? Mm -hmm. And so donardo has got the thing happening, and it's just like that energy is there, no bar lines, no absolutely bar lines. no bar absolutely lines. No and Ornette lines. would be like, it, one, blah, blah, blah. wait, 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 odd number of beats, whatever, one again, like that. But the thing was, it sounded so natural. It was so organic, and yet it was so irregular. And that was so hard. And you know what's funny is, is it, it, I always felt like, I think I'm getting it, I think I'm getting it, I think I'm getting it. And then when the band broke up, and I hadn't played with him for a while, and I don't know, a couple of years went by, and I went back and visited him in New York and went to his place, and we sat down and played some. And hearing that phrasing again, it was mm. like sinking into a warm tub, and I was mm. like, this is so familiar now. Yeah, you know? right, And it's right. too late because I'm not on the gig anymore. But it, mm. I hadn't realized how comfortable it had gotten. You know? Right, right. Yeah, it's, you know, so sad to think that that, that majesty is on, not on that planet anymore. That's what's gone. Because yeah. who else is doing that? That was so personal. That was a, a fingerprint, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, and, and again, you know, I don't get the chance to play with Donardo that much, but it's sort of like, uh, yeah, okay, I've, I've figured out how to, yeah, how to right, capitalize right. on this situation. Right, you know what right, I mean? Right, right, it's right. like I figured out what I can do with Donardo that I can't do with somebody you else. Know, you know, on its concept of harmonics, you know, why value an, one note, even if you're in a key, why would you value that over another note unless you don't know how to place that note right. in a good position to amplify the key, you know what I mean? Or in it, he was just amazing, you know. So let me ask you something he used to spring on me sometime, because if you don't know the answer, I don't know who mm -hmm. to ask. <laughs> but we'll see. So you know when he'd say something like, okay, play me a trumpet note on the piano. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I'd say, all right, so what is it, a certain key? No, 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 no. And I said, well, is it like mind over matter? Like I'm thinking trumpet, you know, but I'm playing the No, 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 no. It's, you're actually playing a trumpet note on the piano. And I'd be like, well, what, is he, what does he mean by that? And so I'd say, so can you do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be, all right. I said, well, all right, well, can you show me? You know, and he'd be like, all right. So, and he'd go, you know, do his thing. And he'd go, now I'd say that's a trumpet note. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, but he wouldn't really explain it any farther. And I couldn't tell if it had to do with the pitch if it had to do with my frame of mind, you know what I mean? If it had to do with a timbral thing, or, or if it had to do with the range of the instrument. I mean, uh, do you have any clue what that was about? It could have been everything you mentioned, you know, yeah. uh, especially in the composition. You know, the trumpet would always take a note that was a, a leading tone. You know, it was either the highest tone or the most, the middle tone with the most attack. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So. If he said a trumpet tone, it would have to be in the trumpet range. It would have to probably be in E flat or something like that. <laughs> and you'd have to, you know, play it with an attack and a sustain. Like, ba. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ba. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, he wasn't talking about, you know, dial up a synth sound. Yeah. He was saying play a piano note that's like, you know, yeah. like that. You know, to understand him. You'd have to understand how he thought. He would give obscure answers to every question that we had, you know, and you had to figure it out. One time he said, you know, I, wanted, I want you to play Anda. I said, what do you mean, Anda? He said, Anna, Anna, Anna. 
Uh -huh. <laughs> so he didn't want me to end the phrase or get into the end of one or end of two. He, yeah. I, it was always a pickup he wanted me yeah, to play. Yeah, yeah. And think of, thinking of that conceptually is the hardest thing to do when you're required to play what somebody just emotionally said to you. You know, you can't just do it. You have to rehearse it and practice it. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things we had to do it immediately you know, once he said it, we had to show that we had some idea of what it was, you know. You know, on a very late visit with him, and it made me think, if I had just known enough and figured out how to ask better questions yeah, earlier. Man. And when I, I had gotten so that my questions were getting better. Mm -hmm. And if it's like I always feel now, it's like I tell my own students, if you figure out how to ask a good question, you, the universe will open up for you. you know? Yeah, it's really true. And he said, um, you know, he said, in harmonics, uh, any word or term that we use, there is a word that means the same thing in traditional music theory. And I said, all right. And I said, so then in harmonics, I said, the way you talk about clefs, what is that in traditional music? And he said, range. Right. And he said it like, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? too much. You know what I mean? Like, right. well, well, why, you couldn't figure that out? Yeah, why didn't right. you ask me that before? You know, it was like that. But when he said it, it was like, well, of course. You know, it's yeah, like, well, of course. It's, right. it's like, you know, have the, the irony of like playing Flight of the Bumblebee on the tuba or something mm. like that. You know what I mean? It's sort of like that's the whole personality of the, of the cleft, mm -hmm. you know? Mm hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. range. Because the way he would talk about the clefts, I would like, it's almost like he's talking about the, the astrological sign yeah, of your yeah. instrument. Right, because yeah. remember, he didn't believe in the chords. He believed in the voices of the chords being separate. Right. You know? And you know, he never wanted me to play like chromatically voice led chord progressions. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to pick it up and put it down, you know, take triads and things and jump up and down. Yeah, play some, yeah. Right. Yeah, he said, play sounds, don't play chords. Wow. Did you ever hear him mention a scale degree beyond a seventh? Cause no, for, no, he, yeah, he never yeah. did that. Because yeah. like 9, 11, 13 was always, like, so like in C, 9, 11, 13 was a D triad right. over, the C. over the C. So yeah. you had two strong triads rather than increasingly weak extension. Right, you know what right, I mean? right. And so it was always strength to strength that way. Yeah, and that's how jazz is. It pays up on the higher harmonics of the chord. Right, you know? right. But he never wanted to, to talk yeah, about it Yeah, he doesn't look, like, yeah. look at it like that. It's like, know? I think for him it was like, why would you do that if you could have two strong triads? You know, and I think he was hearing, you know, each instrument in its transposition, you know, in concert, if you know what I mean. Uh -huh. Like he knew that there was a transposition with the trumpet and the saxophone, but he was hearing the concert note of the transposition right. of the trumpet. So it seemed like he was hearing two, th two or three notes at the same time. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you know that um, uh, uh, unreleased Coltrane album that they came out with a few years ago, it called uh, Both Directions at Once. Mm. And I remember years ago him saying to me one time, you know, one thing I like to do is start an idea in the middle and then work out to the beginning and end at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then when I heard that, I thought, well, you know, he and Train used to practice together. I bet this is something they talked about, you know? Yeah, you can imagine, you know. And I think I read something where like Wayne Shorter talked about a, a similar thing, this whole thing of, because that deal of not starting at the beginning and then going through to the end, but starting in the middle somehow and then, you know, mm -hmm. working out, destroys that, that kind of linear time. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's, it's now, then it's then, then it's later, and then it's, you know, right. where you end up. But it's just sort of like, wherever you are, it's right now, it's right now, it's right now, it's right now. Yeah. You know? And it's not that telling a, a story thing. Because, you know, that was another thing was, he was such a master in playing like in those early records where they were taking individual solos over your walk and mm -hmm. bass and ride cymbal where you would go in start your solo play by yourself develop it bring it home end it hand off to the next guy and you know there's a certain 
mm-hmm. skill in doing that and mm-hmm. certainly do it. And in prime time, it was that thing of that modern 20th century nonlinear time where it's, it's always right now, it's always the present moment. And right. what went before and what comes later is inconsequential. It's always, right. you know, you're always right here. And I know when he, he first went back and did the thing with um, Pat Metheny where they were taking individual solos and then when they got the quartet back together, I was wondering, is he going to be able to go back and do that other thing? Because that's a certain mindset and it's a certain, is he going to be so in the, in the, that new frame of reference mm-hmm. where it's always right now, he's not going to be able to do it. He did it better than he ever did it before. I mean, it just, just masterful mm-hmm. where he could set up a beginning, middle and end and at the same time, take time and stop it and say, it's right now, no. hold, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it and then let it go and then let it go forward again and stop it again. And just that ultimate, control of, of yeah, time yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if all you had to do was just listen to him. And so natural, like he's, you know, fall, you know, he still had that, 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 that country thing, you know, that right. regional accent, that yeah. Texas, you know, blues and whatever it was. Mm. And yet doing yeah, this stuff is just ridiculously for Yeah, he yeah. was extremely soulful. Yeah. You know what I mean? But at the same time, he was just like you said, extremely masterful. I mean, you, who else has that tone on the alto and saxophone? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I've never heard anyone sound like that. Yeah, it's like, you know, country and city and simplicity and sophistication. Right, you know, right, I mean, it's just right. like, just and, unbelievable. And yet, and yet wrapped up into a personality so it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 a something that, that had to be made up beforehand. It wasn't artificial, you know, it wasn't constructed that way. Just, just, being himself, you know. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. thought, well, if I'm that, if I'm myself to that degree, what's that going to sound like? You know, it really puts you in that position. Mm-hmm. And then you realize, not only do I have to work on my instrument, I got to work on me because yeah, exactly <laughs> because exactly if me comes out and it's not interested, right? That means it's like you know, I haven't lived enough, I haven't learned yeah. enough, I haven't whatever. Yeah, that's what Owen had said about prejudice. I mean is because of the way you're thinking that you feel a certain type of way about a certain thing. I mean, you know, a C and a B, they're right next to each other. You play a B low and a C high, and you better put a G in there, or somehow it's going to be, you know, like something that's out. But no, it's not out. It's just a half step away with the C on the bottom and the B on the top. <laughs> Everybody hears that. You know, yeah, but yeah. why can't you play it the opposite way? Because people don't want to hear that for some prejudiced reason. Mm. Not that it sounds bad, you know. You know, when I heard the Skies of America theme, I was just blown away at the different melodies and things he had going together. It was just, you know. Yeah, right. and like I say, he could hear them. He could hear yeah. them all, you know. He wasn't surprised when he when it came out, you know. No, you know, not at all. Like, yeah, no. it was there. Do you, um, you did a couple of the Skies of America. Yeah, yeah. It was, do and my remember? first and last gigs over the decade, yeah. Do you remember when the trumpet players had a problem? Oh, we, we, with when one we of got, his uh, parts, you know, we got uh, had to bring in ringers for the trumpet. He part, said, yeah. "Yeah, man, this part is too high to play so softly." He said, "No, no, it's not. Just play it." You know, every time we, we got to that part, Ornette said, "No, no, not so hard," and Ornette and picked up his trumpet and he played those high notes so softly the trumpet player just got mad and had to go for a walk i mean unbelievable yeah he had ridiculous trumpet chops yeah that, he that really did people still haven't caught up with. Right. I, mean, it's, <laughs> I mean it's it's crazy yeah so you know it's uh, uh as you said it's a it's a thing about uh, uh getting out of yourself and growing as an individual and when mm-hmm. you're as fortunate as i was to walk in a situation and have people that generous just just take you in and give you a, a life's education. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh, I, pleasure, yeah. man. Pleasure, man. So beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Let's do it again. So we should talk more often. Al was always yeah. in the smoking section, so we never yeah. got to talk. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you, Van. Let's, you want, let's you want, do this gig.